All right. We are we're live on Facebook. So I'll, I'll quick say uh, hello to everybody. Um, Brian and I swapped facial hair. Brian's got my beard. I have Brian's clean shaven face here today. So uh, <laughs> good to see you there, Brian. Thanks for joining us. The last time that I shaved my face. Oops, you muted yourself. You, you hit your button. There you go. <laughs> oh, you're on. You got him. Is he back? Almost. Well, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're back. Don't touch anything, Brian. <laughs> we can hear you. We All right. What I might have to do is I might have to just um, bump out a Bluetooth on the car here because that's going to keep on happening. Okay. All right. Well, we got you now. So, um, all right. So, Brian, thanks for joining us last minute. Greg had this idea. Um, he wanted to talk about never losing, never losing a listing again, and how do you how do you always win your listings when you get when you get called? And Tim Creech touched on this last week, and we thought, man, this would be really cool to hear uh, Brian's perspective. You do a, quite a few listings, and so uh, Greg got you in here last minute. So thanks for joining us. And uh, Greg, I'm going to pass the mic to you. All right. So everybody. Um, this is, uh, we're all going to probably be guilty of this today, what we're going to talk about. But what we're going to do is we're going to begin trying to eliminate uh, those items um, that we find ourselves in this marketplace where you just, there, there are not as many listings. So you're not going to get up to bat as many times as we did in the past. And so what I wanted to do is spend some time talking about how do we eliminate or to do the things that are going to increase your batting average. And you know, in baseball today, if you were hitting 300, um, you would be a multimillionaire, but you're not gonna be rich or doing well in real estate with a 300% batting average. And so when I talk with the top agents, I hear numbers that are probably closer to 80 and 90%, you know, not, everybody is gonna connect, right? So you are going to, it doesn't matter what you do, there's gonna be a few that you just can't get because you know what, you don't, you don't match up, you don't connect, whatever. But we wanna not talk about that aspect, we wanna talk about what can you do? And um, so the first question that I wanna ask Brian is, Brian, have you ever gone out on a listing, listing appointment thinking it was a slam dunk. And guess what, behold, uh, you didn't get it. And a couple of days later, you saw somebody else's sign in the front yard. Yes, I have. I have had that happen to me. And doesn't feel really, uh, doesn't give a warm, fuzzy feeling, does it? It's, it's brutal. And so it happens to everybody, but what I asked you earlier, and I loved your answer, and I'm hoping you'll give the same one and not change it on me, um, is how did it feel? What, what was the mistake? What did you do wrong in that scenario uh, that we just talked about? Well, the answer to that question is, is one where it requires eating a little bit of humble pie and realizing that um, the whole world does not revolve around Brian or Greg or Paul or whoever. And you have to understand that with every listing appointment, it doesn't matter how you're feeling walking into that appointment, like it's a slam dunk, like there's no way I couldn't get this appointment. You have to give it everything that you have. And so when I lose out on a listing, nine times out of 10, it's because I didn't try hard enough. And not trying hard enough simply comes from being overconfident, unorganized, not supplying the client with the same amount of information, if not more than the competing agents. And that I only have myself to blame for after walking away. So it simply comes down to not giving it everything you got walking in overconfident, there's no way I can't get this one. And then boom, the sign is in the yard and it doesn't have your name on it. And so what you were just saying is that um, you assumed, right? 
you made an assumption yep. that it was the slam dunk number. So that's the big, huge mistake. And then um, secondly, is the ability to stop and have critical analysis afterwards. Because if you decide to blame the seller or anything else, then what can you learn? Yeah, nothing. It, it really is up to you. And, um, you know, I think that back to that overconfidence piece, you know, people see that and they, and they smell it, they read it, they, they know it. And every once in a while, uh, coming in and, um, eating a little crow and coming in humbly and just saying, you know, it doesn't matter how many houses I've sold in the last year. It doesn't matter how many I've pended in the last week. It doesn't matter what my ranking is in GRAR or in five star. What matters is I get this listing. And I think the thing that people are losing sight of is Greg, you taught me this in the beginning. Um, it's not hard to lose a listing when you get a whole bunch of them. But right now, when you're not getting a ton of listings, it hurts a little bit more when you don't get the one that you thought you were going to get. So the, the idea of uh, being organized and giving it everything you got, it's imperative. You have to go after it as if, if I don't get this listing, my world's coming to an end. Thank you. So this is a multifaceted um, topic and it's probably going to, as I think about it, it's probably going to almost could be a series of maybe three, four or five of these uh, type um, Zooms. Um, so if I break it down a little bit, Brian, talk to me about the things that you're doing before you go on the listing when you're on your game. So I want to know every single thing that I can know about that house before I talk to that client. So I want to go back and check out the history of the property. The simple factors are what did they pay for it? When did they buy it? Uh, I'm going to look at the seller's disclosure if it was a MLS listing and see what that reads as far as uh, mechanicals and water in the basement, the roof age and all these other things and compare those answers to the answers they give me when I interview. Um, drive by the house. My goodness. Driving by the house is so simple. Um, don't park in front of the house, but um, drive by the house and get a feel for what the surroundings look like. Because my biggest mistake in not doing that was coming with a market analysis based on what the internet showed me the surroundings look like. And then when I got there, they didn't end up anything like that. And so I left my folder in the car and they were fully intending on me giving them comps, giving them a full presentation. And I just walked in and said, hey, I, you know, this is not exactly the way that I had pictured it. And um, I'm going to need to come back for a second visit. And if I had just driven by that property, I would have been fully prepared for that appointment. So drive by the property. Um, one other thing that's so simple to do is to try and figure out what has happened in that neighborhood, the closest, like I would say a half mile radius in the last year. So finding anything, even if it's maybe for sale by owners that they're going to throw at you. Did you know about this sale? Um, you know, find out everything that you can find out about that neighborhood so that you're educated before you show up. So you also mentioned, Brian, earlier things like Zillow, uh, probably going to, you know, obviously doing a preliminary search at GRAR or whichever MLS that you're in. Was there other things that you are doing beforehand as well? Do you ever send anything else to people beforehand or do you ever ask them to provide anything when you get there? Um, oftentimes, if it's not a, a warm referral and it's somebody who says, hey, I'm gonna interview three agents, um, I, I ask them to send me a list of recent improvements on the property. What have you done to the house since the last owner had it or when you bought it? Um, you mentioned on the Zillow thing, that is critical because um, if the Z estimate is, uh, let's say, $500,000 on that house 
and you know that that property happens to be worth 750,000, that could be a, an amazing conversation between you and the seller. But if it's the opposite and the Z estimate is 500,000 in that property, just because it needs everything and they've done a terrible job maintaining it is actually worth 400,000 and not 500. You gotta know that they've plugged their address into the Google bar and they've tried to figure out what that property is worth. So you better know that number. Thank you. Paul, any comments and anything we talked about so far? Any other questions? I think, he's right. I think my curiosity though, Brian, is has how has your how has your listing presentation or your first introduction, especially if it's someone that you don't know very well, um, or one where you really don't know if you have it in the bag. And, and again, you should never think you have it in the bag, but when you if, if you walk into a listing appointment now and you were to get a call today for a house in uh, East GR or wherever, um, what are you gonna show up with? I mean, are you, are you gonna do a presentation, Brian? Do you have a legitimate presentation you run them through? Are you gonna have mainly comps or what does that look like? So this is kind of, I am not trying to tell you or any other agent that I would recommend doing it the way that I do it. Okay. Uh, because I definitely do it differently. So what I do is I prepare all the comps, a net sheet, um, everything, all the forms that they would sign, they would get through dot loop. Mm -hmm. I have everything that they could possibly need for information. The BSA looking up the tax lookup. What does the municipality say? What are their property taxes? Have they paid their property taxes? Everything that I need to know about that house is in a Brian Bovin, uh, nothing but the best folder in, in my car. It's always mm -hmm. there. And I leave it in the car. I do not walk in the house with it. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I walk through the door, uh, I always start, I always say, uh, you know, I always look at the house from the top down. So I want to go upstairs and I just make it smooth, casual, comfortable. Show me what you got. And we work our way. If it's a two story upstairs, main floor, lower level. And then we end up, I always end up saying, you know, where do you like to sit in the house? Uh, where's the most comfortable spot for you? And I usually will end up uh, in their living room or in their family room or something in a recliner or uh, even on a sofa or something like that. I think the days of sitting down around the dining table and handling business that way are kind of, I would say it's not as often as they were when I started in the business. But in that moment, I have kind of, compared to what I have in the car to what I really think that property is. Now that I've been through the whole house, ask them tons of questions. Have, you know, have you had this furnace work done it? You know, look at the dates on the water heater, look at, look at everything you can see. Have you had water in the basement? How's the roof been? Everything that I know, I now know if I have to go to that market analysis in the car, if that's even going to be accurate. So I'm not telling them that I have that in the car until I know that it's necessary. But I would say, be honest with you, that I do not do a formal presentation 75% of the time. Okay. I, I literally tell them that everything that they need to know about the house, if they're looking for information is in the car. But I'm just telling you, based on the amount of houses that I've sold in this area, your house is worth $300,000. Now, my cards are on the table. Run through the fees with them. Now you know what I think of your house. What did you think? Okay. And then from there, Brian, how do you, how do you move this to a listing? I mean, do you, do you try and close right there? Or are you just sort of, hey, what's your time frame? What, what goes next? So... You know, I have to back up a little bit because um, before getting to the house, that phone conversation, I want to know why I'm even coming. Right. You know, am, I, am I coming because you're moving out of state? Yep. Am I coming because you lost your job because of COVID? Am I coming because your wife or your husband decided they didn't want to live with you anymore? Why am I showing up? Um, so that's that's number one for me is I want to know because if you come at it from a standpoint of how am I going to help this person instead of how am I going to get this listing, 
you're going to get a lot farther by how am I going to help this person than just trying to land the sale. You know that. So um, from, from that being said, at that uh, in that living room, I'm going to go over a time scale with them. And I'm going to say, what what works for you? Um, assuming that they're getting another house, I'm going to go over financials. I'm going to ask them if they need to sell their house before they buy another one. If they're financially capable of buying first and then moving, I'm going to go over the state of the market, tell them that um, if we're going to sell your house, I'm going to ask you to move out for five days. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have a place to move to, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why is you're going to go crazy trying to keep this house ready for showings if you're here. But you basically move forward at that stage, like we're going to work together. Yes. Uh, let's map the future out now. Um, here's, here's, here's a timeline we can work with. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Like I, uh, Greg, Greg said earlier, you know, the assumption, um, I'm going to assume that we're going to work together uh, based on my confidence level and um, go in fully confident that we can work together, um, but not being overconfident. Right. Okay. So, so Brian, a couple of quick questions I'm going to try to get through here, and then I want to get to um, one of the key items, I think. And so, you're, you said earlier that you're 50-50 maybe on a one-step or a two-step, right? Yep. And what kind, what kind of drives you one way or the other there? Well, I think the one-step, uh, meaning one appointment, um, is going to be that close sphere referral. So I'm feeling like um, this, these people have been told by their friend, their family member, their coworker that I am very competent to sell their house and that they will be very happy working with me. That's probably going to be a one-time appointment. If I get a phone call saying, I see your signs in the area and we're interviewing agents, that is going to be a two appointment setup because I, I'm going up against other agents. Clearly they're telling me that even if they don't tell me that, I know that that's probably the case. And that's a good assumption to always take is that you're not the only person they're talking to about selling their house. But the reason why I do the two, two appointment on the, on the cold lead, let's call it, or the not as warm lead is because I want to literally just get these people to like me mm -hmm. in the, in that first appointment, their house might, might be part of the conversation towards the end, but I first have to earn their trust and I have to get them to believe in their mind that this is a guy that I'm going to work with. And that's why I want two appointments. Okay. Do you, do you discuss agency at all? Like if you're going to be a dual agent or a solo agent? Single no. Agent? Okay. Um, all right, here is, uh, you know, to give the, um, the, the people, the agents right now that are on here, um, some real meat to grab hold of uh, from this uh, short call today. Um, we talked about why do they end up listing with you, Brian? Yeah, so this is, this is my style. And again, just because I do it doesn't mean the way that everybody else has to do it, but I don't. Uh, you know, we have our own sphere of influence. And so telling the uh, five star what exactly I do, the only thing that would do is help other people. And I want to be able to help other people. And this is what's worked for me. So I'm a firm believer that you have to spend money to make money. And that just is a business model that I've embraced since day one. Like if you don't have any money to spend, it's hard to make money. Um, you should get some money, earn some money, and then take that money, spend it, and make more money. But without money, it's it's tricky. So at any rate, um, so let's just play a scenario that Paul is the person that is interviewing me to sell his house. And I walk up Paul's driveway, and I know before I get in the house, man, this thing, the way it faces, doesn't get any sun exposure. This thing hasn't been pressure washed in five years, probably, or more. There's moss on the roof. It just looks tired because of, you know, the way it sits. Yep. I am already detailing out that I am prepared to have that house pressure washed before I even step in the door and meet the person. 
So when I when I walk in, I already know that I'm going to spend three hundred and fifty dollars on my pressure washer, um, and I use the same company every single time. Under pressure is the name, mm-hmm. and they use more of a hot water than a high pressure, and that causes less damage to the house. So that's step number one. Step number two, I walk through the front door and I noticed that they have three or four children and these children have been running their toys into the walls for years and there's scratches and there's dents and there's, it just looks tired. And I'm looking at my surroundings and I'm saying, they probably are not capable or they don't have the time to paint this wall or this room so I have that in my mind I'm going to paint that room and um, then as I move my way through the house I look and I realize that this person has a uh, a hoarding problem the the rooms are so full you can't even walk through them and that it's going to be a major hang up to get that person to move forward and get that house ready if they don't have help So I already know in my mind that I'm going to provide help on boxing, on donations, on pickup and drop off. And, uh, you know, and I can keep going on and on and on, but I think you get the point. Every house has different needs, but just to finish that statement, I'm going through the house and I'm realizing this person does not deep clean. They probably haven't deep cleaned this house in two or three years and it's not show ready even if the paint's fine it still needs a very very good cleaning that cleaning is also about three hundred dollars and i know that i'm going to pay for that so on average just to give you numbers if i am looking at a three hundred thousand dollar listing i am likely going to spend between a thousand and a fifteen hundred dollars to get that house ready and that's between my stager coming in that's another thing that i didn't mention we own all our own furniture so and it's not expensive furniture it's not fancy furniture it just looks nice and it's great in pictures so i have two storage units full of furniture and i'm telling this person they have to list with me because all of the things that are going to hold them back from being ready to sell i'm going to do them and I'm going to pay for them. Mm-hmm. So basically what you're doing, Brian, is you're setting yourself apart because there's probably not any of the other two or three realtors that walk through that just offered to put a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars on the table of your own money. And I also am aware of a situation. I love the story where you went out and um, the, everybody doesn't know it, what you did before you got into uh, real estate, but you uh, were a cement flat guy, right? You, <laughs> yeah. you cement, right? Yes. And, um, and so you went to a house, the patio was all broken up and they were going to say, hey, we need to hold this off because um, we need to get this done. And you said, I can get this done this week and you guys can pay me back uh, at the close and you got your, you found a group of people, you were out there yourself with a wheelbarrow busting up cement, and you uh, you had a new patio within a couple of days. So the point being is that this is some over and above, and it's not always gonna be that way, but I just wanted, I wanted these agents to know what they are up against if they are going to compete with a top agent in the market for a listing. And I know for a fact that other top agents at Five Star do a number of these things. Um, and, uh, um, and so that is the competition, that is the level. And, um, and so agents have to figure out, maybe they can't afford 1500, but maybe they can afford 500. And today, you know that if you get that listing, you're probably gonna get paid And um, whereas today you can work with a number of buyers and time is money. And um, you know, how long does it take to work with a buyer today to actually get a house? You know, is it gonna be three offers, five offers, 10 offers? Is it gonna be heartbreak city? Um, On and on it goes. So listings are the name of the game. Listings are how agents last in this industry. And um, and so, 
Paul, anything you want to chime in on there um, before we go? Uh... You know, I think that what, what Brian says is, is uh, has a lot of truth. The fact that he's willing to pull out the checkbook right off the bat and commit to that property and show them that he's willing to commit to it by investing in the property, getting the home back to where it should be. That says a lot about a realtor when they're willing to open up their checkbook and invest in the home before, you know, they've sold it. Um, you know, once, once you have a commission check coming, it's a little easier to give some money away, right? Once, you, once you've already got under contract and maybe you're trying to keep it together for a few hundred bucks, it's a lot easier. But when you throw that money out there before you've got it sold, that says a lot about the realtor. But even if you're one of those realtors that um, wants to do the same kind of thing Brian's doing, you don't have the money, um, donate your time. Get your friends over there to start painting. Get your friends over there to start hauling junk out of there. Do whatever you can to get that, that uh, client to where they need to be and show them you're willing to go the extra mile. I, I think that goes a long way. So Brian, yeah. let's talk about what are some of the, uh, we got just a few minutes here, but what are some of the objections that you hear as to why they're not going to list at that moment, which you know maybe are just objections to kind of keep you at bay a little bit and you've got to kind of break through those objections to get to that signature on that listing agreement. Because in the end, if you don't walk away with that signed document, you've got nothing, right? Yes. Well, I will tell you right now, I'm sitting in front of a house in East Grand Rapids right now, and um, I just interviewed with these folks and the objection or the, let's say the, we don't know what to do yet is, the capital gains. And I called Paul right before we got on this call about, you know, how close they are to that two year mark and talking about proration and how, and how an accountant would figure that out and everything. But their, their, their increase in value is significant from what they paid for, for it, you know, 21 months ago. It's very significant. And not only is the increase there, alone, but they've also done some pretty major improvements. So these people are kind of sitting on the fence and saying, you know, we're not going to do anything until July or August um, to make sure that, that, that we meet our full two years. That's one. The number one objection on everybody, and I know that this is low hanging fruit and everybody's going to say it is, uh, we really want to capture the seller's market, but we have no idea where we're going to go. Where in the world are we going to move? Mm -hmm. And um, I do not enjoy making people homeless. Like that's not fun because if I get them 20, 30, 40,000 over asking and they're doing cartwheels in the street, singing my praise and a year later, they still haven't found a house and they wish they had their old house back because they're shopping for a year and haven't found anything. I haven't gained a client for life. That's for sure. So finding out where we're going to go is the number one objection. And right now, um, what I'm doing is I'm talking people into building houses, even in the most expensive time to build a house as ever. I'm telling them the reason why I want you to build a house is number one, you're not getting into a bidding war. It's you're, you're going in and you're meeting with a builder, you're getting a lot and you're gonna go through selections and you're gonna get estimates quotes and you have no competition. If you do have competition, it's on the lot. So quick put in a $5,000 mm -hmm. um, you know, deposit and hold the lot, do what you gotta do, but build a house, eliminate the competition and you now have six months to a year to figure out where you're going to move to if you have to move twice or stay in your house because the only thing you need to do when you build a house typically is put down 10%. And if you put down 10% on a $400,000 build job, you probably should have that money some way, shape or form to your, you know, to your disclosure. You, you got to be able to come up with 40 grand somewhere. Mm -hmm. So build a house. That's the number one objection. And then when people say, Hey, you know what? I just don't want to, I just don't want to do that. I'm asking questions like, do you have some place that you could rent? Do you have a place that you could stay for free? Do you have a family member that you wouldn't mind moving in with? Um, so those, 
that's that's the big objection right now is where in the world are we going to go? Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Okay, we are at that uh, thirty minute mark here, Paul, and I brought Brian. No, Brian. Um, well, as always, a pleasure, man. Hey, listen, uh, Greg. You said one thing that I want to make sure everybody's clear on, and Paul, you said it too. You can do the work yourself, but think about this for a second. If you look at it like I can't afford the thousand or the fifteen hundred to spend on it, look at it like you, if you can't afford not to. So if, if I can't, I can't afford to do it. Well, I can't afford not to do it. That's the way you need to look at it, and. That is like on a $300,000 house, $9,000 is the commission. Don't you think that spending $1,500, you know, to make the $7,500 is worth it? Or see somebody else's sign pop in the yard? Yeah. Find the money. Do it. It's too something, expensive not to do it. Something is yeah. better than nothing. Hey, Brian? Yep. You got it. All righty. All right, Brian. Thank all right, you thanks, so guys. for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to all you guys later. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys. Have a good day. Adios.